Well, isn't this just great? St. Patrick's Day is upon us, and all you bastards are going to be treating with the same amount of respect as you do the curb outside the pub that you just vomited all over. My culture is not a costume, okay? We don't just drink Guinness and wear cable-knit sweaters from the Aran Islands. Well, okay, but we sure as shit don't say, top of the morning to ya. Okay? I love Irish cinema and Irish culture, and I am a bit of an Irish history enthusiast. So as long as this channel is active, I will be having an annual St. Patrick's Day video, where I get to bring in an Irish film and we discuss it as a piece of Irish culture, or maybe delve into Irish history. A harrowing tale of the Irish War for Independence that turns brother against brother in the Irish Civil War? I don't think that's such a great idea. A meditation on faith where a priest is told he's going to be killed by one of his parishioners who was assaulted by a priest as a child? I want to do something a bit lighter, okay? Now you're just saying depressing movies to say depressing movies. Tonight I've chosen something a bit more lighthearted. So grab yourselves a pint, have a sit down, and watch as I start my Ned O'Connor Presents annual St. Patrick's Day Bash Extravaganza Movie Marathon first edition. And we're gonna get into a film that has the hallmarks of Irish culture. Wit, heavy drinking, and just a wee dash of gallows humor. Tonight I'm discussing the 1998 film, Waking Ned Divine. Or, Waking Ned if you're not in North America. And as always, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and check out other videos on the channel if you haven't already. What? what no. 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 I chose this film because it's utterly fantastic and many people have not seen it yet. Waking Ned Divine, written and directed by filmmaker Kirk Jones, is about a small town in Ireland, population 52 to be exact, and a significant proportion of that population plays the lotto every week. When the newspaper reports that somebody in their town won the lotto that week, the late Ian Bannon's Jackie O'Shea is on the case. He, his wife Annie, played by Fanola Flanagan, and his best friend Michael O'Sullivan, played by the late David Kelly, take it upon themselves to try to figure out who the person is, so they can get into their good graces and get some of the winnings for themselves. But when they find their old friend Ned Devine has died holding the winning ticket, Jackie hatches a plan to scam the lotto offices out of that money because Ned wouldn't want that ticket to go to waste. Jackie O'Shea is a trickster the type of character archetype that is seen all the way through history in all sorts of mythologies. Tricksters are characters who exhibit wit and intellect in order to play tricks on people for their own gains, or sometimes just to mess with people. Think of the classical mythology characters like Odysseus, Anansi, Maui, Loki, and even those damned leprechauns as examples of tricksters. And Jackie's trickster nature is shown from the opening scene of the film. Here, he is sat comfortably on his chair with his dinner in front of him, watching as the lotto numbers are announced. But there's something that he wants. His apple tart is in the kitchen with his wife Annie. So what does he do? As the numbers come in, he starts saying that 19. There she goes. That number, his number. First number, got it. Second number, got it. And as the numbers continue, he gets more intense with the, oh my god, we're about to win a bunch of money. By the time he says he hits the fourth number, Annie comes in awestruck. And when the announcers relay the sixth number of the lottery, he shouts, yes, 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 as he tears apart his ticket. Confused, Annie asks if they won, and Jackie simply replies, 
But it got me apple tart brought in now, didn't it? <laughs> and of course, this gives him a well-deserved slap to the face. This is a perfect way to set up the character and show the audience what type of movie they're going to be watching. And Jackie's trickster attitude is further developed throughout the film, especially in the first act when he's trying to figure out who in the town won the lottery. He treats Finn to a pint at the local pub because he thinks Finn won the money after seeing him driving a convertible throughout the town that day. But this only bounces back on him. Many times in the first act when he's trying to figure out who won the money, because he's spending money, gotta spend money to make money, and many people assume that he's come into some money. And his response is very flighty like a trickster. No, just treat me friends the little I've got. His attitude is so wishy-washy and his nature is so well known in the town that even his closest confidant, Michael, right before they figure out who won the lottery, he begins to suspect that Jackie is the one who won the money, showing that both his duplicitous nature is well known and that even his best friends are not above him playing a game just for his own fun. Behind his constant smile, his carefree attitude, and his friendly demeanor to everyone around him, there's always a ploy going on in his mind, which makes him a fun and compelling character to watch. As the trickster of the film, Film, Jackie makes every key plan, avoiding obstacles as they come up. And when at first they can't figure out who won the lotto, they figure out who all the regular lotto players are in the village and invite them to a chicken and whiskey dinner, where the guests get all boozed up and Jackie, Michael, and Annie try to figure out who won the lottery. When the evening seems to end on a disappointment, Annie realizes there is one chicken dinner left over, Ned Devine. So they go over to Ned's house that night through the storm and find that he has died with the ticket in his hand. Instead of letting the fortune die with Ned, Jackie makes a plan to try to just simply pretend that he's Ned and calls the lotto offices saying that he has won. He sets this up with his friend Michael as he memorizes all of the important numbers and life events that might be asked in such an inquiry. And of course, they do this on the beach. Where else would you do this? But when the Lotto Man, not known by Jackie that he is the Lotto Man, comes to the beach asking for directions as he has no idea where he's going, Jackie quickly rolls with it and he seamlessly changes his plan from him being Ned to Michael being Ned, and using the Lotto Man's unfamiliarity with the location, as well as his preconceived notions about old, small-town Irish villagers. I've always walked my way around these hills, the mist and the fog. He is able to buy time for Michael to go to Ned's place before they do. But as much of a trickster as Jackie is, he isn't as selfish as someone who is trying to scam seven million pounds from the Lotto as one might be. So when faced with Failure, as the Lotto Man says that he will come back and verify Ned's identity with the town, and that would fail miserably as Michael is clearly not Ned, he decides to get every villager in on the ruse, and they will split the seven million pounds evenly among everyone in the village. And this comes to a head when he is in mid-eulogy for Ned. The entire town is in the church and Jackie has come up and is about to say his words for Ned. However, the Lotto Man shows up and makes his presence known with a large sneeze. This allows Jackie to quickly pivot and make it so that the entire village is here for a funeral for Michael. And it's in this moment where Jackie gets to be completely honest, while also lying through his teeth. He makes a comment about how wonderful it would be to visit your own funeral, as the things said at funerals are often too late for the one who has died. And in this speech, he calls Michael his great friend, something that he doesn't think he's ever said in person, that he is someone who he grew old with, and as they shared laughs together, grew young with. And no, I'm not crying. I'm not. You are a monster. Every film is a love story. Well, at least every film has a love story. And no, I'm not talking about specifically romantic love. And in this film, while Jackie has Annie and they have a love that is represented throughout the film, Jackie's true soulmate is Michael O'Sullivan, Jackie's partner in crime. And Michael might be the most 
unlikely criminal that has ever been. He is uncomfortable with deceit, even so much as to be unable to tell the woman who has a crush on him that he is not interested. But he's clever, always in lockstep with Jackie without having to be told. And when the plan requires him to become Ned, he does it, even in his own utter unbelief in his ability to lie. And look, it's completely impossible for someone to explain why something is funny, because humor is subjective and sometimes it doesn't translate between cultures. But a scrawny elderly man on a motorbike, fully nude, as he races through the village to get to a place before a car gets to it, that's just funny. <laughs> objectively hilarious. And Kirk Jones knows what's funnier than showing an old man naked on a motorbike? <laughs> showing another old man naked on a motorbike. The best thing David Kelly brings to his performance is the subtle nervousness of his character. And while the character of the Lotto Man can write off this nervousness as the winning jitters, we as the audience know that his nervousness is, holy shit, I'm about to be found out, I'm terrible at this, he knows, he knows. It's just a fantastic performance, and the way David uses his body language, his eyes, and his stature, he fully makes his character believable as this neurotic elderly man who is forced into this criminal scheme. The moment when Jackie introduces Michael to the Lotto Man as Ned, Michael constantly glances over to Jackie as if to please help get me out of this situation, and it's just fantastic. He's jittery and terrified, and that makes us, the audience, care for him. We don't want this little man to go to prison. It certainly wouldn't suit him. Much like those clothes, am I right? And the way he goes straight to the whiskey when they start talking business. Just a fantastic character moment. But ultimately, he's not just this scared little man. He can do what needs to be done. And he leans into his lying nature. Especially the scene when he's sitting on the toilet and he's reading off Ned's information to the Lotto Man. But you can't have a love story without chemistry. And the chemistry between Jackie and Michael? This is what I want my best friend and I to be like in our late 60s, early 70s. This chemistry is represented in many scenes, but is specifically shown in the scene when the two of them are dealing with Ned's dead body. As gruesome as it is, dealing with a dead body. The two of them bring this childlike playfulness to the act of doing bad things to a corpse. Whether it's trying to massage his face out of the winning smile that he has frozen on his face, or whether it's trying to force the dentures back into his mouth. Only from a strong, lifelong bond will men walk naked into the beach together, share a tiny bed together, or ride on a motorbike like they do. Finola Flanagan's Annie is the voice of reason in this film. As Jackie's wife, she has a bit of the trickster in her, but the opening scene shows that she is also very much tired of his little games. After Jackie tricks her into bringing in his apple tart, Annie slaps him in the face. It is a very simple yet character-defining action that defines their relationship. Jackie will trick Annie, Annie will be upset for falling for it, and then he will get what's coming to him. The film starts with Annie and Jackie trying to figure out who the winner is. And she is far more subtle than her husband, which allows her to pry without suspicion being cast on her. But once they find out that Ned has passed, she is out. This shows that while she's willing to skirt societal rules to scam a few pounds, once it becomes an illegal situation, she wants no part in it. And when she finds that Jackie and Michael are continuing the plan, she is livid. Specifically livid at her husband, because she knows that A, Michael would not be involved in such a scheme without Jackie pushing him into it, and B, Michael's kind nature is not cut out for duplicity, and he will get caught, and that will be a problem. And even while she is furious with Jackie, she is worried about him and wants him to stop because she cares, seeing the hole that he's digging himself into. But when she realizes that Jackie's plan has changed, from a self-centered scam to try to con the lotto out of a couple hundred thousand pounds, to splitting nearly seven million pounds with the entire village, she sees the heart of her husband and she joins back in on the ploy, becoming very much a key part to getting the entire town on board. The film brilliantly shows how this elderly couple 
relates to each other, continues to love each other, and betters each other. As to the C story of the film, which is just a running subplot that really doesn't actually connect to the main story at all, but is utterly enjoyable, is the love story between Finn and Maggie. Finn, played by James Nesbitt, is the local pig farmer, and he is utterly smitten with Maggie, played by Susan Lynch. And Maggie has a thing for Finn too. It's reciprocated. She even goes as far as to say that she would marry Finn if it wasn't for a certain smell. If it wasn't for the smell of them pigs. If it weren't for the pigs. If it weren't for the pigs, I'd marry you tomorrow. Now this subplot doesn't have much substance to it, but it's really fun to watch Lynch and Nesbitt play off each other. They express their love from afar. They come close. And as they're about to embrace, a look of disgust crawls across Maggie's face as the stench hits her nostrils. Finn tries different soaps, is genuinely a respected member of the community, and tries to help father her son Morris, who he thinks is his son, but that's a whole other thing. But still, it's the pigs that keep her away. But they're able to get together at the end of the film because they all get the money and as she says, No more pigs. No more pigs, Maggie. But the love story is genuinely funny, even though it's just a running gag. But you can't have a film without an antagonist, and we get that here in the form of Lizzie Quinn, played by Eileen Dromi. She's the most vile member of the community, and that's saying something because this guy is in the community. This aftershave is a knockout with the girls. Am I right? That guy sucks. She refuses to pay for things, berates everyone in town, and is just generally the most unpleasant person in the entire island of Ireland. She is the embodiment of selfishness in this film. And that's saying something because we are following protagonists who are essentially trying to scam money from the lotto for their own personal gains at least for the most part of the film. And when the entire town decides to split the money, giving everyone an equal share of 120,000 pounds, thereabouts, it's Lizzie Quinn who threatens to call the authorities and get 10% of the winnings unless they give her a million pounds. And in the final act, the climax of the movie, we get the best payoff to a setup we didn't know was coming. So there are certain things you need to understand to follow this payoff. Firstly, all the phones are down in the village because of a storm, and the only one that works is a payphone that is up the road. It sits on a ledge of a cliff, which is important. Secondly, the man from the lotto gets hay fever every time he comes in the country, and he sneezes violently. Thirdly, the regular priest is out of town, but will be coming back soon. All of these things are properly set up in multiple scenes throughout the film to make the following series of events make sense and be very refreshing. So the payoff is intercut with the townsfolk in the local pub celebrating and watching musicians play after the lotto man handed the check to Michael. And every element that I just mentioned is about to come to a head. Lizzie is riding her scooter up the road to get to the payphone, it breaks down and she has to walk the rest of the way. She gets to the phone, we see the man from the lotto office is driving and struggling to breathe because he's about to sneeze. Before her call gets connected, the lotto man sneezes, losing control of the car. The car swerves, inches past the payphone, and when he gets control of the car again, he sees a van on its way towards the village. They swerve out of the way of each other, and the van? Well, let me just show you. That's right, rejoice for vehicular manslaughter. Huzzah! But that van was driven by the priest on his way back home. Possibly the perfect little cinematic plant and payoff. It's great. And finally, the character that really ties the film together isn't a character on screen. It's the music. The score of the film utilizes the song, The Parting Glass, a traditional song that evokes the parting of friends and, let's be honest, sometimes death. It was originally a Scottish song, but with the High Kings, the Clancy Brothers, the Dubliners, the Pogues, and most recently Hosier, all recording versions of The Parting Glass, I think the Irish might have claimed it. It is very much a somber yet joyful song that evokes a wake or a funeral, where the protagonist is about to embark 
and a journey that is not specified, but he wants to have one more drink with his friends before he goes. The lines of the song, since it fell into my lot that I should rise and you should not, is just such a beautiful way of expressing parting, especially with an undertone of death and loss. And the wordless tune is woven throughout the score of the film. This way of using the song gives the film a tone of an Irish wake. There's drinking, there's sadness, and there's fond remembrance. So when, at the end of the film, everyone is on a cliff, holding up drinks, looking out into the ocean and saying, To Ned. To me. To me. The song comes on in its full bombast as we gently fade to credits. And I have still yet to find a better way to end a movie. It is just so much love. So that is Waking Ned Divine. For all of you who haven't seen it, please do. It's light. It's a perfect example of how to craft a comedy film through genuinely well-written characters. And it's just a nice little bit of Irish culture. I hope everyone has a safe, or had a safe, if you know, this is going to be up on St. Patrick's Day and most people celebrate St. Patrick's Day the weekend before St. Patrick's Day. So I hope everybody had a safe holiday and I hope you didn't imbibe too much on the green beer. Look, I don't know why American traditions on St. Patrick's Day have taken hold. You know, green beer, pinching people, trying to get random people to kiss you because you're Irish. I just don't have the patience to really get into all that. And don't get me started on the luck of the Irish. They are probably the most unlucky people, at least in Europe. But if you want to listen to authentic Irish brogues, watch a film that will make you smile, and celebrate this holiday the proper way, might I recommend you watch Waking Ned Divine? Or, you know, you could just read the writings of Bobby Sands if you want to harsh your buzz. So, anyway, thanks for watching. Like, share, and subscribe. Make sure to check out some of the other videos if you liked this one. I will be back with more content in the future, and until then, sláinte. Yeah.